um, div subatomic particles divided into two categories, not really categories based on what they are, but based on how they treat one another. We, we went over that quite a bit. <clears throat> And they were named after the people who discovered them, their last names. Fermions are those who push away or keep other subatomic particles at a distance, arm's length. And bosons are those that, um, well, the, the uh, physics term that I used was they're huggable. Um, you could even say they flirt with other bosons. They, they clump. They get together. They, um, <clears throat> and those are strictly behaviors. Now, we're talking about physics now, but we're also talking about believers and how we treat one another. And when, a, when you look at those subatomic particles, they are exactly the same. Exactly the same in their makeup. It is strictly a matter of how they behave towards one another. And <clears throat> so um, we're going to talk about that. And then I wanted to talk about... Um, Gravity a little bit. We'll get into that more probably the, toward the end of this class. But we'll start with a scripture in uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing un uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Okay, no, that's not the word gravity that we want to talk about, but it was in the scripture, so I thought I'd let you know that the word gravity is in the scriptures. All right. Um, back, on these, back on this difference of how these subatomic particles that are of the same DNA and same family treat one another. The fermions are those that push others away. They don't, they don't separate completely. They just keep them at arm's distance. Bosons are those that join and literally join in uh, to that. I'm not going to reteach the class, but that's the basis of what we discussed last time. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you one of the traits of fermions that we didn't discuss last week. Fermions are immortal, and bosons are not. All right, what's the, what comes to your mind when I say that? Does it, yeah, they, they live forever. Okay, now does, what, what, knowing what a fermion is, for those who were in the class, knowing that they keep at arm's distance, they don't join and everything, then what is the concept? I mean, first of all, if you were a superhero, would you like to be immortal? Yes. Right? You pretty much, that would be a nice thing to have. You know, being able to fly is good, but being immortal would be better. Right? So when we think of immortal why would the fermions be immortal and not the bosons, which are the ones who join together? Well, I'll start with the first hand that I saw. Kelly? Ooh. Is that what you all were going to say? Yes? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Very good. Good responses. The bosons can be produced because the nucleus, when they're attached, is inert. They cannot just keep going and going and going. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> you guys are into 
I mean, uh, there, there are certain realities that govern, I mean, the, the, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. It is all an expression of the Lord. It, it is by him and for him and to him and through him. All of these things are. And if you quit looking at physics or any other subject and you start examining it in light of the Lord, you will find the Lord. Now, it's interesting because I intentionally threw you this, I'll call it a curve, I intentionally threw you this curve by writing that Fermion, and putting their name down first and writing that they were immortal, hoping that you would take the nominal Christian bait. And that is, <laughs> and, and that is go, oh yes, immortal, that's, that's a trait of Jesus. That's a trait of, of uh, you know, a wonderful relationship with the Lord. And yet, you guys responded correctly because fermions are immortal because they won't die. Yes. You know, I hope that got picked up because immortal means without death. And then the real statement that he made was, and that's not a good thing. Why would that not be a good thing? That'd be a wonderful thing because the cross, because life comes out of death, because increase comes out of death, because uh, uh, everything that it exists, and you know, I would still, you know, we, I'm sure we'll have enough time for me to do it, but I'd still like to go by, back and discuss um, the death of the sun, you know, a little more, yeah. I just wanted to say, even in that, you know, it's God's economy, you know, not just required here, it's God's economy. Winter precedes spring. There was evening, and there was morning. Right. Darkness precedes light. Death precedes light. Death must come first in order for there to be life. So if that case, it's immortal, then one might not just say it's without death, but that it's without life. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another hand. That, you know, are you getting this? Are you getting the reality that, uh, and, and that was a great scripture to draw from. The evening and the morning were the first day. That death comes first. That winter, that the sun going down, that the, the death of the sun, as it were, its disappearance, its death, and darkness falling upon the earth. And the morning are the first day. And those together, folks, death and resurrection go hand in hand. And I, let me tell you this. This, this. this is profound and yet common sense. You can't have resurrection without a death. It's impossible to have a resurrection. There has to be a death before there can be a resurrection. Now, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of Christians get excited and go, I want resurrection life. Well, good. Are you willing to die? I mean, how many? I have been to conferences where they're shouting, Where? You know, do you want resurrection life? Well, come down to this altar. Well, you do have to go to an altar, but it's the cross. Because there has to be a death. But going down to that altar is not going to the cross, nor is it even a simulation of the cross. It is the exact opposite. It's not going down there to lose. It's going down there to gain. It's not going down there to die. It's going down there to come, you know, to be better off because you, you know. And so, and so the nominal Christian is sucked in by the word immortality, and yet Jesus is immortal, and yet he died. Didn't he? Because in the economy of God, and I use that, that phrase, that's a, that's a for, it was a foreign phrase when I first started hearing it, and then I began to understand what it meant, and it means in the way that God operates in the economy of God, in the way that God operates if he's going to, to uh, bring forth anything, he's going to go supernova first. He's going to die. He's going to die. The sun is going to die. 
we, we covered that in the past, but I, I, there's a lot more that I can add to that area. But every particle, every, every particle that exists, exists because of supernova or the death of the sun. <laughs> well, everything exists because of the death of the sun, Jesus. You see? And all of those things are but shadows over and over and over playing themselves out in the universe, being studied and everything, continually declaring the glory of God and continually declaring that there is nothing, nothing exists without the death of the Son. So, you, you think, you know, Okay, well, God can't die. But Jesus died on the cross. Amen. Okay, I, you know, it's not my point to, study, to, to explain all that right now, but, but the point that I want to get across is in the economy of God, in the way that God works, it's always a cycle. It's always this cycle of death and resurrection continual cycle, death and resurrection. And most Christians do not know this reality of God. It is, it is God. You can say that it's the way that he works, but it is, this isn't something he does. This isn't omniscience or omnipotence or, or, or humility or traits of God. This gets down to the core. And that's, we, we started this class, that's what we were looking for. We wanted to break everything down in physics, in the, in the Lord, until we found the building block upon which all other things are built. Right? That's what we, that's what we set out to do was to find the center point upon which everything else is built. And that's not righteousness. That is not um, uh, evangelism. That is not uh, family. That is not, it is the nature of Christ. And that's what we're discovering over and over. And that's what these things are declaring. And you cannot go very far Let's put it this way. The New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem is what? The bride. Not a city in heaven that we're going to go to. <laughs> Read it. It's in Revelation. It's not a, we're not going to, you know, oh, I can't wait to get that city. I've heard songs all my life about that. So, you know, looking for that city you know we're gonna go yeah we are that city we are the new jerusalem and the lamb is enthroned within her and out of her flows rivers of living water or the river of life but wait a minute yes it's flowing out of her but what is its source keep backing up until you find the building block of all things. Well, if you follow that out, it leads to New Jerusalem, right? It leads to the bride. Keep going in, keep going deeper, and it leads to what? A throne, right? Keep going deeper, and what's on the throne? The Lamb of God. Not Jesus, I mean, yes, Jesus, but not Jesus. The Lamb, the self-giving one, the selfless, poured out dead son that brings it all forth out of which it all comes uh, it's like the beginning the beginning way over here of course we're going to end we'll be here and I know I got all this stuff on the board but just watch what I draw here here's the beginning okay the beginning the seed has got to be there right the seed, not the fruit, not the branch, not anything. The real starter, the central point in the beginning, God. 
And then all things were created by him, and everything, all the universe, and all the things, and everything else. But at, at the end of it, it says, and then it'll, the, the kingdom will be delivered up to the Son, right? And the Son will deliver it up to God, or to the Father, so that God will be all in all. Does it, I mean, that, that's scripture. If you don't know it, it is scripture. Well, what is that telling us? I mean, I mean, it tells us something, doesn't it? Doesn't it say, in the beginning, God? And doesn't it end down here with the lamb on the throne? And yet, that lamb is going to deliver it up because the lamb is only a reflection of God. He's only one. He is the one who came to give us an idea of what God was like. God is in his essence, is selfless, and he, he dies for, to bring forth what is going to be brought forth. It's who he is. It's not what he does. It's not something he did 2,000 years ago. It's something that he's always done. You know, Jesus was selfless in his walk when he walked on the earth way before he got to the cross. The cross was just a big manifestation for our eyes but if you examine the particles here we are physics again if you examine all the particles that led up all the little things that he did you see he's constantly selfless constantly pouring out constantly dying to his own rights to his own benefits because it's a death by nature not just a death outwardly by event. That's huge. It's huge. Because then we're looking for some event. We don't need an event. We need a life. We need Jesus. We need Jesus is the only one that can fulfill that in us. I mean, the Holy Spirit does it too. He doesn't speak of himself. He declares the Father. He declares the Son. He, he gives them all the glory, right? I mean, he's totally selfless. They're all that way, but God chose that all fullness would be in Christ and that he would be the one manifested through us and would make us one with him as body so that that same nature would continue. Now, this is, this is the heart of this whole thing about fermions being immortal. They won't die. They want to live. Bosons, the, the ones that are, are willing to lose their identity for a greater picture, joining to something greater, they will die. Yes. And then what do we do? We bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. I mean, it's, a con it's, a, it's an eternal cycle. And this eternal cycle is also universal in that it is played out in the universe, universal. It is played out in the universe over and over and over as suns go supernova or die. And all this matter is, is sent forth from which everything is built, okay? We've already, for those of y'all who haven't been here in the classes, we've already discussed all that somewhat. <clears throat> but anyway, so a fermion won't die, so what does that mean? I mean, what is the basic thing that that means? It means, you remember now, they keep everybody at arm's length, right? It means that they will remain in the state that they are in forever. All alone. And pressing everybody away. Anybody ever see the, the movie The 300? And there was this guy that this, 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 uh, you know, guy that was all gnarly and, and, and uh, you know, deformed. And he betrayed them to the king and showed them a path to them to be able to destroy him and that was their end 
And the head of the 300 looked at him, and of all the things that he could have said to him, he said, may you, there's something like, may you live forever, may you live long, forever, may you live forever. And if you watched his face, his face at first was, you know, immortal, <gasps> oh, good. And then he realized he's this hunchback that is deformed, and he's, a, he's not just outwardly that way, but he is inwardly a traitor and a vile person. And he realized, oh, my God, I don't, I don't know that I want to be immortal in this state forever. You see, immortality is not the issue. Because if you get immortality, I mean, can you imagine, you know, here's the old three wishes. Three wishes. Well, I want to be immortal. But if you never change out of your fermion state, then you will be that forever. Because there's some, and what does that tell us? There's something higher than all of the high things that most of Christianity is shooting for. That's one of the purposes of this class, is to identify the highest thing, and in this case, through quantum physics, we're actually finding the lowest thing. Now, in a couple of weeks, I don't know when, but a couple of weeks from now, we'll go back to the universe and we'll look at black holes because black holes contain both quantum physics and astrophysics together, and you begin to see now, because we've taken a little bit of both sides and we're going to we're going to put it all together in a bigger picture by, by means of a black hole. <clears throat> anyway, bosons, these giving, loving, joining by nature, how they treat, they treat one another well. And of course, we're talking about the actual spirit of Christ at work in them, right? We're not just talking about, Ben and I were talking about this at dinner tonight, and we're not talking about lovey, dovey, ooey, gooey, sloppy, agape. We're talking about the real thing. Okay, because have you ever met somebody that just, they just ooze, you know, sweetness, and yet, you know, it's like, they're just like all, you're just kind of going, you know, you know all, all sweetness can't be good for you. All sweets can't be good for you. <laughs> but if they're always sweet, something's wrong. That can't be good for me. That's what I always think. <laughs> okay? And, you know, there is no explanation of that. Uh, well, how do I know what's what? Here's the explanation. It's either Jesus or it's us. We're either a fermion in, wolf, in, in uh, what? Lamb clothing? you know, and calling ourselves a boson, or it is Christ in us, and only Christ passes the test. And besides, if you perfectly copied Jesus, guess what? The Father still wouldn't be getting Jesus. It'd be you, Mr. or Miss Copycat. And he's not looking for... Here we go again. We're talking about immortality. He's not, you know, he's not looking for attributes. This is shocking to much of Christianity. He's not looking for attributes. He's looking for his son who has certain attributes. He's not looking to you to live sacrificially. He's looking for the crucified life, and that's Christ. That's the Lamb of God. Why? Why? Because from the very beginning, God said, I will put my son in you, and you shall be a son to me. I will dwell in you, and you shall be sons. Amen. He didn't say, be sons, or he didn't say, act, you know. I mean, imagine, now this is, this is a real situation and not tainted, but imagine a father who had a son and then he had a neighbor kid, and the son wasn't getting with the father and being about the father's business as much as the neighbor kid. Well, I know in the, in, uh, 
the mafia, that's okay, I guess. But in the kingdom of God, he can never, never, ever reject his son. And he can never, ever take anything above his son. So what did he do? He not only told you how to live, but he put the one who knows how to live inside of you. But the father looks, and he doesn't go, oh, I'm so proud of you for living correctly. No. He goes, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You see that? Maybe in the old covenant, but we're not under, under the old covenant. It's not commandments. You do this. Don't do that. Do that. That's wrong. And again, if you do everything right and it's not Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Father's still not satisfied. He's still not getting what he wants. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's good. That's good. That's really good. Because he made him that way. He didn't tell him, well, go suck honey out of the rock. You know, I know you've told people go suck an egg or something, but he, <laughs> he didn't tell. He made him to be able to do that. So that the commandment is fulfilled by the life that he gave him also. That's basically what you're saying, right? I mean, because he makes us that way, but he doesn't make us that way. He places Christ in us who is made that way, and we live by Christ. Beautiful. I didn't hear the second one, but the first one is really good. And he said, the day, the day of yeah. death is better than the day of your birth. Yeah. You know why there's only one who can give us life? Because there's only one who has that life, and he doesn't just have it. He is it. Yes, yeah, Scott? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I mean. The nominal church is populated with fermions. You know how I know? Because they've reduced the gathering down to Sunday morning once a week. I mean, even when I first started, when I first started in the Lord, it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, and then you'd have something else during the week also. But, I mean, for sure, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. Most churches, folks, are only Sunday morning. Uh, and it's like, well, you know, they're backing up. The fermion, that's what a fermion does. It, it keeps you. And you know what? It's hard to examine somebody when they just walk through the door smiling. They're all cleaned up and fresh. And, hey, hey, brother, oh, you know, you must be a sweet brother, you know. And, you know, he's a mass murderer, but we wouldn't know, you know. I mean, how would you know? 
Yeah. Well, and so, I mean, there, that I believe that fermions have invaded the church and have set the tone. And, uh, and you know, this is, right now I'm just talking, this is my opinion. You don't have to believe this or agree with this or whatever. But um, when I look in the book of Acts, when they didn't have any rules, they didn't have a pattern, do you understand what I mean? Like, like I, I've had brothers say to me, you know, uh, a pastor who's pastoring a church talking to me as a pastor. Well, we've patterned our church after the book of Acts. Well, I said to him, well, who did they pattern theirs after? <laughs> they were the book of Acts. Well, they patterned it after Christ. And, but they didn't go, okay, let me look up there in heaven and see. No, no, no. It was the formation of life, and they began to come together, and they began to have all things come. There began to be a real flow of life, man, and it was, it was alive and real. And in fact, these bosons stuck together so much that God did say, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he said, you know, they were hugging one another so much that he finally sent persecution, and that scattered them all over the world. And everywhere they went, they, they joined. They went to the synagogue. They went to where the people were. They, they were constantly joining. You can't stop a boson. You can't stop the sun. A, a, a boson, I erased it, but, you know, it's this, you can't stop the sun from being the sun. You can't stop Jesus from being Jesus. That's why, yeah, it's good to learn a bunch of stuff, but learning a bunch of stuff is not the answer. Amen. Please, please listen to me. Well, I thought that's what this Bible school was about. Well, you thought wrong. This Bible school is about learning Christ. This Bible school is about hungering and thirsting for him, to want to know him, to see him. To be changed by the revelation, the unveiling of a hymn. Not a set of doctrines that we all can say. And, and then you can say it and still live like a fermion. And you know, it's harder in a place like this to live as a fermion. It is. It's hard. But, you know, and that's why some people get upset. Because they can't live the inward life of a fermion that wants to just keep everybody at a distance in a place like this. But in the nominal church, baby, it works. It works well. It is a perfect environment for fermions. Okay? So, again, all this is parenthesis and, and um, you know, so, uh, and I'm telling you, this is what I believe. This is the way I see it. You don't have to believe this. But when I look in the book of Acts, I see that they, they didn't have a pattern. They didn't know a pattern. They had to get hold of the Lord. They had to have the life flowing in them. And when the life was flowing in them, they were more like a boson than they were a fermion. That's, that's the deal. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so when a, when a, uh, there you go. When a uh, boson, I don't know that this is going to work here. <laughs> when a boson dies, okay, so here's, here's a boson. And this, remember, we're teaching physics, but we're also teaching Christ. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and uh, I tell you what, you'll remember your physics after this. You'll remember it way better than just going to a physics class. When a boson dies, it actually doesn't cease to exist. It dies and it splits. It splits into two or more <coughs> lighter particles. 
it's it its death is actually defined more by a multiplication into others than it is by an annihilation because it is not annihilated it is split into many more than itself and what was the uh, particular thing that bosons had that fermions didn't they were um, conduits for energy fermions have no energy they can't they can't produce that and guess what bosons can't either but they are conduits for it they are channels for it and so we talked about the energy being the Lord the light the power whatever the energy thing is the force the power um, they they are uh, transmitters through which this energy can flow but a fermion can't do that its only energy is its resistance yes Pardon? Are the particles that that breaks up into, are they still bosons? Yes, here? Yes, okay. Yeah, we're talking about the little chart I drew with them splitting into several. Yeah, it splits into bosons. And it's always two more, or two or more, and it divides, this, this boson that dies divides its energy source into them. It divides it among them. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Now this is, right now I'm just talking physics. But physics is talking declaring the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And so it's not just a death. It's not just the bringing forth of more out of that death. It is the same energy that was at work in it begins to be dispersed into them. And then, as it were, that boson does pass from the scene. But others are formed as a result of that. And in a sense, you could say it forms more of itself, but it's not. It's a death to itself so that others may be formed. Um, but then it, pa uh, it passes along its energy and it continues a cycle of doing this like, boson like suns before it. And we'll see that when we get into talking about supernovas. Suns before it, because we're talking about you being a son of God. We're talking about this cycle being repeated in you also, not just in the original, but in you. And it continues a cycle that literally populates the universe. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yes, sir. Amen. Well, that's a good way of putting it because uh, that was one of the things I was going to say next, and that is fermions have no heirs. They have no heirs. They have no heirs. Why? Because they can't die. There can't be an inheritance unless there be a death. Right? You inherit when someone dies. And there are no heirs. Yeah. Not to mention it's impossible to lay hold of something if it's elementary. Right. Not to mention if you're if you're always repelling. And and I want I want to say this. I think a lot of fermions don't know that they are fermions because I don't think they are aware of what they're exuding. I think in their mind. And in what they think their actions are, they are embracing and, you know, friendly and open and everything. 
and this isn't true of all of them, but I think some are, are this way, they do not know that they are sending out signals that does keep everybody at arm's length. I know people like this. I know people right now like this. And no matter how sweet or how accommodating they are, there's still a, that, that distance, that wall that keeps you out. Well, you know, and by the way, when we get to the class on supernovas, when we get into that a little more, we're going to see how even fermions can come into oneness. Isn't that great? There's an answer. It's not, they're not doomed. <laughs> You're not doomed. And if you, if you kind of look and go, well, I have those tendencies or whatever, you're not doomed. There's always an answer. Yes? Well, some of the things that we're discussing right now, um, I hope you'll remember when we do get into um, black holes, because we're going to see this on a subatomic level and on a universe level. And of course, that would have to be true, whether big or small, whether just a cell, you know, one cell in your body carries all of your DNA. Did you know that? Just one cell has all of your DNA in it. It is a microcosm of you. Okay, the same thing. That, that's biologically a fact. What we're going to show is that it is, I was going to say astrologically a fact, but I'm going to say astronomically a fact. And, uh, and it is on a quantum level also. Yes? I, th I think the, the whole thing of holding, holding people at arm's length, it, I mean, it's completely a self-preservation thing because, you know, to avoid death because, I mean, I've actually heard ministers say stuff like, well, you can't, you can't spend too much time with, with those people because they'll just suck the life right out of you, you know? <laughs> And it's like just this, you know, I've got, to, I've got to keep that distance because otherwise I'll die, you know. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's an interesting way of, of putting it because a fermion is holding everybody off because they don't want the life taken from them. Now, again, this is, this is an amazing thing because a fermion and a boson are exactly the same when you examine them physically. Exactly the same particles, they're, the, again, I, I mentioned this last class or whatever, their names are only based on how they treat other subatomic particles. That's all. And therefore, they're not a boson or a fermion. That is a designation of how they treat one another. They are all subatomic particles. They're all in the family of subatomia. Okay. We're all in the family of subatomia. However, the issue is not what you were made by God at the cross and in the resurrection. The issue is how you treat other subatomians. Amen. <laughs> how you treat others. And when you get into the scriptures, when you, when you start looking at the scriptures, it's this pattern is over and over. For example, Paul's letters. He'll start and 
if it's Colossians or Ephesians or Galatians or whatever, uh, Romans or whatever, he'll start and he'll start talking about the reality as it is in Jesus, the reality as it is in heavenly places, the reality is as, as you are seen as a subatomic particle. Do you understand? And it speaks to all Christians, all subatomians, all of us, and it says, this is true of you by virtue of Jesus' death. Amen. Settled. God is not questioning your uh, standing before him. Your standing as he sees you is you're in Christ. You couldn't get in there unless you went through the cross. Can I get an amen? amen? You can't get in there unless you go through the cross. But guess what? You went through the cross, not on your own, but Jesus took you there. You were crucified with Christ. I like the Spanish. In Galatians 2.20, Con Cristo estoy juntamente crucificado. With Christ we are jointly crucified. We all went into that death. When he died, I died. When he died, you died. When he died, we died. We don't have to crucify ourselves. It's impossible to crucify yourself. Climb up on a cross with a hammer and a couple of nails and see how well you do. Tum, 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 you get one thing in and tum, 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 you get your feet in then you go well, I can't do the other hand and as long as it's self crucifixion there'll always be something dangling there'll always be a part of you that is loose there'll always be something that can do stuff <laughs> you know what I mean because you it's not you know it's like get these flies off of me you know <laughs> hey you you know <laughs> pointing down you know and, and, and Direct and try, hey, you idiots, slow down over here. Why don't you go, you know, I mean, you know, as long self-crucifixion leaves something loose. But when you're crucified with Christ, it's all nailed up there. Yes. Being given long enough to self-crucifixion, you to pull yourself off. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, and that brings up a thought. And if you're if you're about the business of trying to crucify yourself, if you're about the business of self-crucifixion, where is your focus? It's on you. It's on how you're doing, what needs to die, da 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 da. That's why Jesus had to settle this. Because if your understanding of crucifixion is with Christ, where is your focus? It's on Jesus. It's on Him. And it's not being consumed, get ready, with how you're doing. It is consumed with who he is. Amen. And you'll be consumed with who he is when, when this reality dawns on you because um, your true identity ended at the cross and your new identity started in the resurrection. Yes. Now, who are you talking about? Joe. Joe.
Well, you know, Job really is a, a good book uh, based on this because there, there is a, a, an unchangeable, unchangeable principle in the heart of God, in the heart of God the Father. Before the foundation of the world, you can read this in Ephesians and you can get it in Colossians big time. Before the, the world began, he decided to create a world. He wasn't thinking about, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invent nuclear fission. I'm going to create bunnies. <laughs> I'm you know, I, mean, I don't know where your mind could go. You know, you go anywhere from great science to you know, cute whatever. But he didn't go there. He had one thing in mind, and that was not just to create stuff that looked like the sun, like a supernova or a subatomic particle, fermions, bosons, or, or, or anything else that we've discussed or what yet will discuss. He, I mean, think of this now. This is big stuff. He did that, but he only did that to point to the real, which was going to be the Son in you as the fulfillment of all he wanted out of you. Okay. You got that? So imagine, okay, just play like this would be the case, that the Father would be so set on this that he actually created everything by him and for him and to him and through him. He was so Son-minded when he, when he did it all that he cannot be diverted. He cannot be fooled by copycats. He cannot be satisfied by copycats. Are, are you following me? Okay. That in mind, now if that was really the case, and you, and you looked up on that throne and you saw the Father and you said, look, you know, if you're going to go in there and talk to the Father, I mean, he's right there on the throne. You're going to go talk to the Father? Let me, let me give you a hint. Just talk about Jesus, okay? Because this guy is so focused on Jesus that anything else is probably going to hack him off. I mean, I'm just, but you understand what I'm saying. I'm trying to draw a picture here. I'm sure that that's not what people think heaven is or whatever. Um, and so... And so now, if that's true, if that's true, and that's always been true, picture this, the book of Job. Satan comes into the throne room of God, and God says to him, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him. Oh, he is so good and righteous. My first thought would be, Where's Jesus in this? If you're so focused on the sun, why are you pointing out this dude? Well, I know why he's pointing out this dude, because of what Carolyn just said, that all of that stuff was good. It was for God. It was, you know, I mean, even, even it says, we think that this is the height of honorability when it says that he regularly sacrificed animals for his children lest they had sinned not knowing. Folks, this guy was full of fear. And when it all comes down, it is said to him, the thing that thou hast greatly feared has come upon you. All right? You following this? That you can be meticulous. You can be a perfectionist. You can do everything right. You can be an elder son. His words to his father was, I have done everything right. I have never messed up. I'm never going against you. But he's treating that kid, that prodigal, like a son. And he did treat him like a son. I won't get into all that now, but it's, it's incredible. I need to, to stop here. But so 
So what does he do with this perfect specimen of a man that is not Christ? He puts him through the cross. He puts him through the cross until he comes to a revelation of Christ. And in that revelation, he said, you know, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. That was his testimony. But now I see thee face to face, and what was the end result of that? I abhor myself and repent in sackcloth and ashes. Now he sees the Lord. When you got that big a contrast, you're not trying to be somebody you're not. You're not trying to impress anybody. You're not trying to, you know, come up higher. You know, it's so funny to me. We may just not have a break. We'll just go right into the next, not really, really. But it's so funny to me that people so don't, so don't understand the nature of the Lamb, so don't understand the way that God is, that they will actually take the lowest seat with the hope of being brought up higher. Instead of being the lamb and taking the lowest seat and really being happy there because it's the spirit of Christ at work in you to be content in whatever state you find yourself. Instead of going, oh, I don't like this one. Well, that's your flesh. Oh, I like this. Can I do this? No. I mean, I'm not saying that, but God will say that to you. Your father will say no. But I really like this. Well, you know, you need to try something that you don't like. Why? Why would I want to do that? That doesn't seem right. For simply to bring out stuff in you that is not Jesus because you said you want to be conformed to the image of Christ and you'll never know how much you need conforming until I start doing some things like that and you have so protected your life, Mr. or Miss Fermion, that you kept everything comfortable. You got a, you got a, you know, you got your little nest and it's feathered and it's all fluffy and it feels good. And, you know, you can sit down there and keep everybody away from stealing your feathers until you pray that faithful prayer. God conform me to the image of the Son. <laughs> if you hadn't already prayed it. Think twice about it before you pray it. Amen. Don't pray it unless you mean it, because you know what? If he hears that, he just believes everybody means it. <laughs> the father just thinks, you, everybody ought to really want my son. Okay? However, you know, and I'll try to end with this, however we hear about, you know, oh, it's so bad, the cross, and those people preach the cross, and they have to take the lowest seat, and all this kind of stuff. You know, there is a glory and a, a, a joy and a reality within you and within him that you have with him that's so much greater than that lower seat that you, you, you think you're on the top of the world. You think you're sitting on a throne in that seat because you're so with the Lord. But how are you going to find that out unless you go there? And how are you going to go there unless you got the right spirit in the first place? you got to count the cost. And then there is, you find that place and uh, you know the the the, uh, the recommend recognition and the accolades of the world, whether it be Christians or whatever, anybody outside of the Father honoring his son, just doesn't mean as much to you as it did. You just don't want it as much. You just don't need it. I, I, need, I need someone important to say I'm important, you know? Well, the Father will say you're important when it's Christ in you. You are eternally important to me. I, he looks at you and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Is there any higher joy? 
Is there any higher joy of not being seen, but the Father actually seeing Christ? That's the goal. He must increase and I must decrease. Great phrases, great scriptures, tough to get there. But when you do get there, and you will get there, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There's that word, make you free. But you shall know that it doesn't say set you free. Make you, and so make you suck honey from the rock. Okay, let's take a break, and then we'll come back. <laughs>